Hi, this is Seth Fleischman with World Hustler by Jew. Did you like the lecture? Well, guess what? I've got my own YouTube channel, World Hustler by Jew. You can either search it on YouTube or if you just go to the address on the screen, that'll take you right to a bunch more of my videos. So if you enjoy what you're watching, you want to see more, you like what you're seeing, then please like the video on YouTube, subscribe to my channel. It's the only compensation I get. Uh, if you want to know even more about my projects, then get yourself added to the weekly email. Just Send an email over to historybyjew at gmail.com and I'll be happy to add you to the list. Thanks a lot for watching and I hope to see you at a future lecture. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me back on your channel. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be on the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. And what an odd question you have for me. You get the World History by a Jew guy to explain to your viewers why Jewish myth is wrong. Well, to a certain extent. There is a, a tradition about the Jews building the pyramids. And what I'd like to do is take what we know from the scripture and then mix that with what Egyptology can tell us. And we're just going to see where it falls. But it's, uh, I, I greatly appreciate your invitation to be part of your debunk series. And without further ado, let's get started. So there's a tradition going way back, both in the Jewish world and in the non-Jewish world, that the Jews built the pyramids. And I intentionally took this picture from the Ten Commandments in 1956. This movie is certainly the most famous media portrayal of the Jews building the pyramids. However, it goes back, actually there was, same director did a Ten Commandments movie in the, the 1920s, but it goes well, well back before the 1920s by the, by the interpretation of Herodotus, I think that he's already talking about 100,000 slaves building the pyramids, which was inferred to be the Jews. But it didn't stop 100 years ago, and it didn't stop 50 years ago. This, this still continues to this day. So as recently as the Exodus Gods and Kings movies in 2014, you still have these images of the Jews building the pyramids and Moses coming and rescuing the Jews from this. This movie, by the way, was not allowed to be shown in Egypt due to historical inaccuracies. And while I'm very much a First Amendment free speech type of person, I can understand why the Egyptians did not particularly want to see this in, these inaccuracies portrayed on the, the big screen in, in their country. So our question for the night, did the Jews build the pyramids of Giza, these great monuments from antiquity, wonders of the, of the ancient world and the modern world, really? Can we give the Jews credit for building these? Let's take a closer look. We're going to start off tonight talking about when the Great Pyramids were built. So we're going to get our dating down, and then we'll go into the maps, and then we'll go into the archaeology of it. So the pyramids started with really Dozier's Step Pyramid, and it's that pyramid, although it's still amazing to this day, it's not really what people tend to think of as, as the pyramids that they imagine. But if you want to count that as the first pyramid, then you're looking around 2650, 20 to 2620 BCE when that was finished. Sneferu was the first one to build a pyramid the way we imagine pyramids, but it took him three times to do it. And so we had the Bent Pyramid that which collapsed uh, in, internally, and you can still see where they put wood planks in there to try to save it, and it didn't work. Anyway, you got to give the guy credit. He came back on the third try. He does get his pyramid built, and it does look like the pyramids that we imagine to the day. But when we talk about the Great Pyramids, what people most imagine are the pyramids at Giza. And this started off with Khufu, who was Sneferu's son. So Khufu was to build the Great Pyramid, which was the tallest building in the world, oh, from about 2500 BCE to the Eiffel Tower in the 1890s. I'm not exaggerating. And then his son, Khafre, would also take a, a shot at it. And he would build a pyramid, not quite as big as his father's, uh, but because he built it up on a higher plane, it looks taller than his father's. But just, just to make sure that he was the greater builder, he also built the Great Sphinx. And then after this, these were the, these were the two pyramids everyone most imagined. And you got to think of our dates. We're talking about 25, 25 BCE. And the next one was 2491 BCE. By the time we go to the, the third, the Menkares pyramid, you already see a large step 
down in size. So this is putting us into the 2400s BCE when this is finished. And, and that's it. So I've done the, I've, I've done several lectures on ancient Egypt. And when I cover the old kingdom, you can almost just see everyone's shoulders drop when I say, okay, we've, we, you know, that's it. That's the end of the pyramid era. We hit the, we're, we're still in the old kingdom and here it is. The great pyramid building is done. Uh, but there were more pyramids built in the fifth and sixth dynasties. And these pyramids you would recognize clearly as pyramids are just much smaller than their predecessors. The middle kingdom, you would, continue seeing pyramids built as well, but these were mud brick interior with a uh, stone exterior, and then ended up, some of them were just mud brick, and these are all just heaps of nothing now. It's not what people think of when they think of the pyramids. They're at best piles of, uh, of dirt sitting there with maybe a few rocks spread around. Eventually they figured out building this gigantic monument that people could see from miles around and know that there's a ton of gold inside of them, Probably not a good plan in the long term, but nonetheless, you would see people try it here and there, pharaohs try it here and there, all the way to Achmos, who's the first pharaoh of the new kingdom. But like I said, this is a big step down from what we think of when we say pyramids. So what I really want to focus on are the great pyramids of Giza first and for foremost, and here are our dates for those. And then, and this is, like I said, these are the three, because these are the three, you always see the picture of them together that, that I just had in the previous slide. This is what everyone thinks of the pyramids, but I'm going to expand the range a little bit of our thought process, because I want to go a little bit before and a little bit after, really cover anything. When you go on a pyramid tour today, these are the pyramids you're going to see uh, in that, the blue rectangle. So let's start from there. So just keep in mind, uh, these are our main pyramids, and these are this is the date range we're working on. And now let's move on to the maps. As you can see, this this map right here, which is really like a tourist map, gives you a nice little taste of what ancient Egypt looked like from top to bottom. But if you notice up here at the top is where you're going to see the pyramid. So we're gonna uh, I want to lock in here to these this top section, and we're gonna zoom in as we always do with our maps. And there you go. So. This area far in the north is our pyramid area. In that previous slide where I just had them listed, you're gonna find all of them in this, this area right here. So you see it's not that far geographically speaking, but yet Egypt's a pretty big country. So now those are where the pyramids are. Now I wanna talk about where were the Jews. So let's take a look at a little at a, another type of map and some scripture to go along with it. So where were the Israelites? Now the Israelites, you could find, uh, this map, by the way, is an Exodus map. I'm not doing the Exodus tonight, although I will mention it again at the, the end, but this is my best map for showing you where the Israelites were located. So if you look here at these, these quotes, let's look at a few of these. So we hear, see that the Israelites are supposed to stay in the region of Goshen. Thus, Israel settled in the country of Egypt in the region, region of Goshen. There, the, they had taskmasters over them. They built for the Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses, on that later. Again, region of Gotham. And then when the Israelites left, we'd see they went from Ramses to Sukkot. And you can see here, Ramses to Sukkot. So I just want you to get a feel for what area we're talking about. This is Goshen. You see Goshen here on the map. Everything I've just talked about is basically happening in this area right here. So now we're going to get rid of this, this scripture here on the right. And now I want to add our map of the pyramids. And here you go. You can see the Israelites were up here on the northeastern quadrant of the country. And then you can see that the pyramids were down here in the more of the southwestern area of the delta. Now, it seems like it's really close when you look on a map like this, but it's not as close as you think. So what I want to do is look at the distance between Giza and Ramses. So Giza's around here, and then we're going to look at Pi Ramses here. Remember, that was one of the cities Israelites helped to build. And we're going to switch to Google Maps. And what I decided to do is just go to Google Maps and measure what's the distance between, Gaza, between Giza 
and Pi Ramses. And when you put that into Google Maps, you conveniently find out that it's 118 kilometers, which is 73 miles. And what I like here, just to kind of, thanks to Google Maps, it tells us the 24 hour walk in, in modern times to walk from one to the other. Now, the reason this is relevant to our story is if the, the Israelites are working up in this area, right? And the pyramids are down here. By the way, he's is the closest location for the pyramids. 73 miles is pretty far to go in a day's work. Even in modern times, when we have a car, uh, if you were walking, carrying heavy stones, that'd be a little bit beyond one's uh, realm of movement in one work day or even really one work week. So that distance already tells you that it'd be pretty hard for the Israelites to build the pyramids. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the pyramids themselves. What are the pyramids? All right, so why was a pyramid even built? So basically a pyramid is a tomb, right? It's, it's a grave for a king, for an Egyptian king. And the, this tomb was to guarantee a safe transition to the afterlife for this king. And it had food and supplies and valuables and everything and luxury items, everything that king would need in their transition to the afterlife. Uh, both to survive and to live in luxury. So that was number one reason for a pyramid. Number two was it was a temple complex. So without getting too much into Egyptian religion, remember the Pharaoh is the incarnate of Horus on earth. So that's the falcon god. You can see I put a statue of, of Horus right here. So Horus is the falcon god, and he is, and the Pharaoh is this god on earth. But at death, there's a transition. So Osiris, which is right here in the middle, Osiris is the god of the afterlife and the god of the dead. And what's different about the Egyptians is most peoples, you think of the god of the dead with a negative connotation. This was not the case for the Egyptians. Osiris was a good guy, really. He was the god of the dead, but he was a good guy, and he was the god of the afterlife. So this, this king, when he dies, is transitioning from being Horus the son to Osiris the father. And this was an honorable thing. This was looked at in a, in a positive light. And now when the old king, the dead king, becomes associated with Osiris, now the new king, usually the son or whoever his successor is, would now become the new incarnate of Horus on earth. So this, the pyramids were a temple complex. They built a, a, a religious site around around the pyramid, and it was used to worship this Horus Osiris divinity and their, their religion. Now, the third reason for the pyramid was as an icon, and it was really a monument, okay, so a monument to the sun god, and the pyramid is thought, and by the way, this is not specifically written anywhere, but just in the Egyptologists say that the, the pyramid is thought to symbolize the rays of the sun, particularly what they look like coming through a cloud. So I, got a, I took a couple of pictures here to show you what we're talking about. And if you see these rays of the sun, uh, that you can definitely see how that becomes uh, identified with the pyramid. And also, it gives a ramp, right? So for the king to kind of climb up into the, the stratosphere, so to speak. And you have to look at it from someone staying on the ground looking up to the pyramids. The pyramids are reaching into the sky. So it works out perfectly for this to be a ramp for the king to... to, to Walk up the rays of the sun up into the heavens. Lastly, we see the pyramids as yellow, right? They're this yellowish, brownish stone, but that's because the outer layer has worn out. I've got a picture I'll show you in a couple minutes of the outer layer, but the outer layer was a white limestone that really gleamed in the sun. So it was very bright, even more emphasizing the, the connection to, to the sun and the sun god. So uh, those are the pyramids, but what were the Jews building? And we're going to go back to our scripture and pull a few lines. So first of all, therefore they, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. The next one, look, let's look at Exodus 1.14. Ruthlessly, the Egyptians made the life, for life bitter for the Israelites with harsh labor at mortar and bricks and all sorts of tasks in the field. And finally, no straw shall be issued to Israelites, 
but you must produce your quota of bricks. All right, so what we get out of the scripture is three tasks for the Israelites. Number one, they were supposed to build store cities, right? And these specifically, these store cities with large warehouses uh, for grain, that's, that's what you would infer from these lines. So they then produce bricks for construction, right? We get bricks a couple times here, but the most overlooked phrase is the last part of this line, which is with all sorts of tasks in the field, with all sorts of labor in the field. So the Israelites were also doing field labor, but that, that gives us our task, right? So they have, they have plenty to do, but, but what's missing? Nowhere does it say that the Israelites were building tombs, okay? There are no tombs in this, this scripture. Nowhere does it say the Israelites are building temples. And especially, nowhere did it say the Israelites are building pyramids. And if they were building these gigantic structures, I think they would talk about pyramids being built in the scripture. So the lesson here is, if the Israelites were building the pyramids, I would think we would be able to read about it. So what were the Israelites building with? And as I mentioned Last slide, we talked about these bricks, and this is a great image here. So this is actually a mud brick from Egypt, and if you look closely, you can see the straw in it. I just think it's a great picture. And then you have a model of these people here making mud bricks. You can see here where they, they had the little mold, and they poured the mud in there for it to dry out in the sun to make the brick. This is very, this is very famous artwork from the tomb of Minna, and you've probably seen, if not this whole stretch of the story you've almost certainly seen parts of it i see this square right here all over the place but this is the whole this is the whole thing you can see here this is the water it's not real clear but this is them getting water for making the mud bricks and you can see the molds over here and forming the mud and then the last step here once it's been dried out is carrying the bricks off so this matches what the scripture tells us I'm not telling you right now, okay, these guys here have to be Israelites, but they're doing exactly what the scripture says that the Israelites did, and that is make bricks, okay? They were, they were building material with bricks. That's what they built their store cities at. Now let's talk about the pyramid building material. What were pyramids built out of? And when you look, by, oh, and before I get started on this, this image here, although just artwork, from a travel agency, actually. I just thought it was a great picture of this, this, uh, of this image of the pyramid is, is white. And this is that white limestone outer casing. You can see how, how white that would be if the whole pyramid was like that. So let's look at what these pyramids were made out of. Most common was, of course, this yellow limestone, and that's what you still see today, these yellow limestone blocks. And I have this picture of it here on the right. You can see the yellow limestone blocks. And then you had this white casing around it. And if you look at the Great Pyramid, you can still see some of the casing it does survive just a little bit at the very top. But of course, it has been outside for far too long to still have that same new whiteness. But we have two different types of limestone, white and a fine, a fine white and yellow blocks. And then we have granite. Now, granite is the gray in this image. So you can see the chambers use granite, add, as does the sarcophagus for the king, the sarcophagus and his, the queen. So the sarcophagi also use granite. As, so it was like a secondary casing stone for the, the pyramids. The pavements around the pyramids, that, that was basalt. That's another stone that, you, that we're using. And then, of course, you have the statues, and the statues would have very high-quality stone like diorite. So after listing all this, you see what's missing, right? What, what's missing? At no time when I listed the building materials of these pyramids did I mention bricks, right? The pyramids were made from stone. So it doesn't talk about Israelites building pyramids. It talks about the Israelites building storehouses. It doesn't talk about the Israelites using stone. It talks about the Israelites using bricks. So you already have two very big strikes against this, this concept. So what were the Israelites building, right? Well, we do know they do exist. It's, this isn't just made up. The, the Egyptians did build large storage facilities for grain. And this carries over great with the, the Joseph story. And I have a whole lecture on that, the seven years of famine. It's not for tonight. But I just want you to see real grain facilities that were from the 
antiquity in Egypt, and I intentionally picked a few from different periods. So this right here is probably the most impressive one. This is the Ramesseum, and it's from the New Kingdom, Egypt. And then up here, we have silos from the Old Kingdom, and that's actually at Giza. And then I grabbed a Middle Kingdom one. This is late Middle Kingdom, maybe second intermediate period. But you have all three eras of, of ancient Egypt that everyone identifies as ancient Egypt, the Old, Middle, and New represented here, all with these these big grain storage facilities, but and all made out of mud brick. So we know for sure mud brick was used. It was just used more in something like this. Also palaces as, as well. But again, we weren't told the Israelites were building palaces. So if the Israelites didn't build the pyramids, who did build the pyramids? Well, there's actually a good amount of data on that. There is a workers' village that's been titled The Lost City of the Pyramid Builders or Hay Ugarab in Giza. And if you look on the top right, you can see the excavation here of this workers' village with the pyramids in the background. It's, it's, a, it's a great picture. Well, Egyptologists have learned a lot from this exercise. They, first of all, have seen that these were very well-built barracks. They, they were accommodation, and these are computer models of what it would have looked like of these barracks. They were for living, resting, working, and fairly comfortable, as you can see, and well-built. There were high-quality mills located at this site. You can see here on the bottom left, this is a recreation of a bedya, which is basically a bread bakery. It was based on the amount of production you could have at the bedya that has been excavated. There was plenty of bread for the workers to eat. But bread could go to a lot of people. What's most impressive is the protein. So they, they've excava excavated bones of cattle, goat, sheep, fish. Okay, these people ate very well. This is not what you would have fed slaves. In fact, I, I saw in, in a couple of the articles, it was quoted as saying that the evidence from the site shows that 21 cattle and 23 sheep were brought in to feed the workers every day. Okay, that's not slave food. These are, these are laborers, but they're not slaves. Also on site, there was a cemetery for the workers and they were each individually buried. And you have to remember this is a holy complex where these pyramids are. So to have an individual grave on a holy complex near the king would be a huge deal to the ancient Egyptians. This is not where you bury slaves. There's not some sort of mass grave pit. Not only that, but these graves for the workers had individual supplies. So you had jars of supplies for the basic necessities for the afterlife for, for these people. Again, not something you would do for slaves. So who were these people? There were basically three types of people at the pyramids. First of all, you had your well-paid officials in charge. I'm not really gonna talk about them but we have two types of the labor force, right? We have our skilled craftsmen, and then we had the unskilled labor. Our skilled artisans were required for the intricate work, right? So these were cutting those perfect stones and an architect to design everything, sculptors for the statues, goldsmiths for the jewelry. These are professionals and they were paid for their efforts. The majority of the heavy calling was from an unskilled labor force, and they did the manual labor. They were quarrying and hauling stone. They were water drawers. They really were doing, literally doing the heavy pulling. But now we know where these people came from, and this was the corvée. The peasants in Egypt wouldn't be paying much in terms of monetary taxes. What they paid back to the state was in labor. Now, Egypt had a couple things going for them. During the inundation season, this was when the Nile flooded and the, the farm fields were underwater. There's no work for an agricultural laborer. I mean, what are they going to do? Their fields are flooded, right? So you have these people sitting around. So the Egyptians figured out what to do with these people, and that is they forced them to come to work. So your tax as an Egyptian peasant was giving three or four months of the year when you didn't have any other work, you would give that to the state. And this was the corvée. 
I should mention the system worked so well that Egypt kept the corvée all the way up into 1889 of the Common Era. But my point, Tony, is you had plenty of spare labor. That does not mean people wanted to do it. Okay, this was this was not fun work. There are records, which I'm going to show you in one second, about people trying to avoid it. And these punishments for avoiding were very severe. This is like, for those of you who are around in the Vietnam era, this would be like draft dodgers on steroids. So let's take a look at this. First of all, if you look at the, the this middle section here, letters about conscript labor, you can see these are officials writing about people who are not showing up for their labor, right? I've sent a list of missing persons and writing to the pyramid town. That was exactly what they were doing. I've seized my, I've seized the account of this workman who is deficit of his state labor, right? That's the, the corvée, corvée. And then you see another one here. This guy's been skipping his duties for many, many years. So what happens when they catch these people who are, who are skipping their duties for many, many years? Well, let's see. Punishment for fleeing conscription. This is actually from the 19th dynasty. This is, this is New Kingdom. But how about beating a person with 200 blows? That's pretty severe. Or here's another one. Punishment shall be done to him by cutting off his nose and ears. Wow, that's even better. And if that's not enough, putting his wife and children into servitude. The reason the punishment for skipping the corvée was so severe gives you an indication the work was not pleasurable and is something people will try to get out of. But your overarching fact, and that's my little fun fact up here on the top, what puts Egypt into its this position to be able to succeed is really the Nile Valley was so fertile, 200,000 peasants produced enough food to feed 3 million people. Let me say that again. With 200,000 workers, you could feed 3 million people. And I don't think there's any other place in antiquity that would have something comparable to that. This means that you have a surplus of labor to a tremendous degree. You also can afford to have a upper class, a very large and wealthy upper class. You can afford to have a priestly class, very large and wealthy temple structure. You can afford to have a military and still have food and labor left over for everyone. But this also tells you something else. In this situation, what do you need slaves for? You don't need them for getting you more food. You don't need them for giving you more labor. What do you need slaves for? They're just extra mouths to feed. So then that leads you to the obvious question. Did Egypt even have slaves? So is the Israelite story just completely made up? I mean, is it just that there were never any slaves in Egypt to begin with? And that we need to look at a little bit more carefully. So before the New Kingdom, there is little evidence of large-scale slavery. So let's take a look at the Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom, I'm dating roughly from 2575 to 2125 BC. There is basically no record of slavery. I say little record of slavery because there's some inferences here and there, but someone could just claim there's no record of slavery whatsoever. We'll say there's a little record of, of slavery on a small scale. Regardless, we don't say anything large. And remember, this is the Great Pyramid era, and I just said there's almost no evidence of slavery whatsoever. I'm going to come back to this point in a minute. Let's look at the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom running from about 2010 to 1630 BCE. Here we see slavery is there, but it's on a small scale. It's in the private sector. Okay, so if you're a soldier and you uh, you defeat a a foreign army, you may get one of those foreigners to be your personal slave, or you could have debt servitude, where someone and we see this in many societies, including in the Bible, that it, that someone who falls too far into debt could be put into servitude. These are personal slaves. In a company, could have you could have what we think of as a corporation with slaves, but the numbers I saw. So I actually looked. I went through all the Middle Kingdom records I could find to see what the largest record of slaves in the Middle Kingdom was, and the highest number I could find was seventy-nine. So we're not talking about hundreds. We're certainly talking about thousands, right? We're talking about less than eighty people was the highest number I could find. Then maybe there's more out there. I, I couldn't find anything higher than that. My point is saying there is no evidence of state 
state-sponsored slavery. So the pyramids already were very old in the Middle Kingdom. So in the Old Kingdom, we didn't have any records of state-sponsored slavery. In the Middle Kingdom, we have no evidence of state-sponsored slavery. Now, there has been a it has been inferred that maybe there were slaves sent to the mines, maybe for the really horrible work, there were slaves that were sent to do that very dangerous job with a short life expectancy. But we also know for a fact this, that we didn't have to infer it. We know for a fact during these eras, prisoners would be sent to the mines. So maybe they didn't need to send slaves to the mines. If you were a prisoner and did a horrible crime, your punishment was you got sent to the mines. So you wouldn't need slaves to do it if you had prisoners. But finally, the new kingdom comes around, starting in 1539 BCE or thereabouts, and this is where we really see slavery starting in Egypt. Okay, so the slaves came to replace conscripts, and like I said, conscript labor stayed almost to our current century. Uh, but nonetheless, conscripts went down and slaves went up during the new kingdom. And this is the first time we see state ownership of slaves. And that's a, that's a big step. And then let's look at who these slaves were. So we have state-sponsored slavery. The state owns these people. Who are these people? Well, they're mostly foreigners. Right? This is starting to sound kind of familiar, these foreigners who became owned by the, the state. And what do the records of ancient Egypt tell us about these people? What did they do? They were farmers. Okay. So they could have been working the field. Does that sound familiar? They were shepherding. Well, we know the Israelites asked to leave in Goshen because they were shepherds. They dealt in textiles. And then finally, what do you know? Lo and behold, they were brick makers. Does that sound familiar? So let me close this slide with a couple points. So two thoughts on our slavery timeline here. Large scale state sponsored slavery did not exist during the Great Pyramid era. Slaves could not have built the pyramids because there weren't really slaves there to do it. Number two, those of you who have been following my Exodus series probably just had a little light bulb go off in their head when I mentioned that Egypt's slavery timeline really didn't start until the New Kingdom. Okay, that should ring a bell. And we're going to take a closer look at that next. I've put three different dating systems on this slide for dating the Exodus. The one on the top left is mine. I get to go first because it's my presentation. But if you look on the bottom left here, we have the traditional rabbinical timeline. And this would be very consistent with any orthodox stream of Judaism. And, you, and then, and I, and I went through this in more detail in the Exodus lecture. I'm not going to do it now. And then this is our other timeline. We'll call this the non-Jewish timeline. So you have my timeline up here on the, the top left. You have the rabbinical tom timeline here on the bottom left. And then you have the non-Jewish timeline here in the dead center. I go through all these in more detail in these other lectures. So forgive me, I'm not going to spend too much time on it tonight. Now, in my own lecture, I have been building. So if you look at these first three points, I kind of covered this in the Exodus lecture. And then later on, I added this first, this fourth point. And then when I did here, this Merneptah uh, lecture, Z07, I added this fifth point. And then when we did the Bronze Age collapse, I added this sixth point, I added a few more details during our first question and answer session. So for those of you who follow my channel and seen my, a lot of my lectures, this will kind of be an exciting moment because I'm going to add a seventh bullet point to our exodus dating thanks to this lecture and that is that large-scale state-sponsored slavery did not begin in ancient egypt until after 1539 bce why 1539 bc that's the date given for when the new kingdom started so whether you someone wants to say it's really 1550 or 1530 or what have you you can go plus minus 20 years without a problem 1539 BCE is, is, is a good enough date to use when the New Kingdom started. Now, our relevance here to the dating is if slavery, in Jewish tradition, the, the bad slavery, the severe enslavement, as it says here, was 86 years. The previous 120 years, there was some sort of gradual transition that maybe it was a corvée type system and became servitude over time. My point in saying this is 
the slavery is said, at least in our Jewish tradition, to have lasted about 100 to 200 years. Now, if slavery could not begin until 1539 BCE, that means the Exodus would have had to have been at least 100 or 200 years after this date. That's the absolute earliest that you could have an Exodus because the Israelites couldn't have been slaves in Egypt before this date because state-sponsored slavery didn't exist. So this gets us down to our narrow dating, and I've shown this in previous lectures, but basically we've been able, using the, these points, and I've decided the seventh, we've been able to get the Exodus date range down to 1270 to 1235 BCE, and I even narrowed it down to a probable 15 years of 1260 to 1245 BCE. This is not the lecture to discuss this very specific dating. My point in bringing this up is to show how this fact about the slavery affects the dating of the Exodus. It also further eliminates this middle one. And uh, I've talked about this, this non-Jewish dating before, but clearly this once again just puts another nail in, in the coffin, so to speak, of, of this dating system, because you just do not have time. I mean, this, this chart is showing slavery lasting three or 400 years, and then an exodus in the 1400s, and it's just impossible. It just cannot happen that way when the state sponsored slavery didn't begin until 1539 BC. But however, we're gonna have a kumbaya moment. I'm gonna bring everyone back together again, so regardless of which dating system you like to follow, I can say that I can cover at least 95% of people, maybe 99% of people, by saying that there's really two options for Exodus dating. You have option one, which is a 1325 to 1175 BCE. This covers my system and also covers the rabbinical tradition uh, in that system. And then number two, we have the non-Jewish tradition of about 1550 to 1400 BC. We're going to come together and all agree it's one of these two, okay? So let's, let's all hold hands and see how this fits into our pyramid dating. And when we add this together, when were the Great Pyramids built? Well, we're going back towards the beginning of our presentation. What did we learn? The Great Pyramids, the Pyramids of Giza, the pyramids we imagine when we talk about the pyramids, were built between 2575 and 2461 BCE. I'm going to broaden the range a little bit because if we add the, the Step Pyramid and then we add the, very, the smaller pyramids, but they were still nicely done stone pyramids in the 5th and 6th dynasties, we can expand our range of pyramid building to 2650 all the way to 21. 75. Okay, well, that, that's a good, healthy range, right? Well, it still easily misses our exodus. So regardless of which of these two dating systems you see, if the exodus happened in 1550 and the Israelites were slaves for, we'll even say 400 years, well beyond what I think makes any sense, that still would put you at 1950 as the absolute earliest moment that there were Israelites as slaves. 1950 BC is still 200 years after the last pyramids were built. And most people would really even look at it as these. So you're then, then you're talking about another 300 years back and it misses by 500 years. And by the way, as I've said multiple times tonight, that's not the dating system I agree with. I would lose, go to option one. And we look at option one, you're like a thousand years old. Okay, at best, if you want 2175, you're 800 years old. There is absolutely no way the Israelites could have built pyramids unless they could travel in time. And I'm not claiming that. So to conclude, did the Jews build the pyramids? Let's summarize. Distance from the pyramids to Goshen was our point number one. So if we're going from Giza to Pi Ramses, our place where the, the, the closest place where the pyramids are, and that's where the Great Pyramids are, to the closest city that the Israelites were known to have built or said to have built were 73 miles apart. That's pretty long for a day's work. Number two, pyramids can be called tombs, they can be called temples, they can be called icons, and of course they can be called pyramids, but none of those are mentioned for what in the scripture for what the Israelites built. The Israelites built store cities and they labored in the field, and it's very clear.
Number three, the pyramids are made of stone. Nowhere does it say the Israelites worked with stone, but repeatedly it said that the Israelites worked with brick. Number four, the pyramid workforce. Well, we have records of the workforce, and there's archaeological evidence of the workforce, and both say the same thing. You have conscription labor, the corvée, and you have the professionals, the artisans. Nowhere does it talk about slaves, and the Israelites were slaves. So got another strike against us. And then finally, the pyramids were built 2575 to 2461, particularly if you're talking about the pyramids of Giza. This predates the Israelites by 700 to 1200 years, depending on which system you use, way off. So did the Jews build the pyramids? The answer is no. Well, that's it for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Please tell Nick to have me back again sometime. I ask you to like the video. If you have not subscribed to his channel, please do so. If you'd like to go to my channel, then here's the link. Feel free to give it a try. And I hope to see you again very soon.